Hi, and welcome to Module 6 of ITI's VPAT training. In this module, we cover what makes a good ACR. I'm Sherry Byrne-Haber. I'm the founder of the VMware Accessibility Program, and I'm currently an accessibility architect focusing on innovation and outreach. And I have with me Michelle Van Duzer. Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Michelle Van Duzer from Oracle. I'm a senior accessibility program manager there. Again, module six of eight modules altogether, we really encourage you to take all of the earlier modules as applicable to your particular VPAT world. So introduction, preparing to write the ACR, and WCAG are pretty much essential, modules one, two, and three. Four and five depend on whether you want to complete the 508 and EN 301549 sections of the ACR. So the goal of this module is to talk about what goes into a good VPAT and to show some examples of good ACRs and bad ACRs. So what goes into a good ACR? A good ACR provides truthful statements of product accessibility. This is not a future state. This is not a wish list. This is how does it work now. An ACR can be a legal document if it's included in a bid or a contract. So if there's dispute later on, it might end up getting introduced into court, which is why it's excruciatingly important that it's accurate. The best practice is once the ACR is written and reviewed for accuracy, it needs to be reviewed by management who's responsible for the product, especially if there are uh, statuses that don't include full support. So partially supports, does not support. Management really needs to have visibility into those. So here's what's the minimum requirements of an ACR. And of course, this is a floor. You can always do more than this. First of all, you have to put in basic information about the product. That's going to include things like the product and the version number, the date of the ACR completion. That should tie to the date approximately that the testing was done. You don't want to, it's not the date that you make the ACR available uh, on the internet. A description of the product, contact information, and what evaluation methods were used to complete the ACR testing and disclosures. You want to include what standards and guidelines that you're covering in the ACR. There's a definition of terms, and then you're going to have a series of tables. And the tables will include one or more of a WCAG 2.x report, either 2.0 or 2.1, depending on what you're testing to, a section 8 report, and an EN 301.549 table. So evaluation methods used can be fairly broad. So some of the best practices for things that you can include in the evaluations is whether testing has been based on general product knowledge. You know, your testers already know how to use the product. If it's similar to another product that you've evaluated, for example, VMware has a lot of command line interface products. And so we refer to other command line interface VPATs because they're all tested fairly similarly. So if that's the case, you can use that in your evaluation methods used. What assistive technologies did you test with? Did you test with screen readers? Did you test with a switch? Did you test with a keyboard? All of these things are really important because it gives the reader an impression of how thorough the testing was and what disabilities the product was tested with in mind. Whether or not you've used a published test method, such as one of the WCAG testing methodologies, or whether you've used a proprietary testing method. What was manually tested versus what was tested by automation. If you're only disclosing automated testing, that's typically a red flag to your ACR reviewers because, of course, only about 30% of tests can be done in an automated manner and about 70% of them require manual testing. So if you're doing manual testing, you want to make sure you disclose that. Was the testing done by a person with a disability? I know how to use six different screen readers, but I don't use them the way a person who natively uses a screen reader day-to-day -day uses them. I do use magnification day-to-day, -day, so that would be something that would be important to disclose if I was doing the testing. Application standards and guidelines tables. So this is at the top of the ACR, and this is where you mark what you're testing and what you're not testing. 
So you can see that you have both WCAG 2.0 and WCAG 2.1 guidelines. And then they're each broken down into three levels, A, AA, AAA. So most people, not always, answer A and AA is yes and AAA is no. If you're disclosing AAA guidelines, then you would definitely check yes for AAA. You also have to do 2.0 and 2.1 separately in this section. So you need to indicate each time if you're doing 2.1 AA, if that's your end level of testing, you're going to mark yes for A and AA for 2.1. But you're also going to mark yes for A and AA for 2.0 since it's cumulative. Then you mark yes or no for the 508 standards and yes or no for the EN301549 standards. So there are five different conformance levels that you can use. Supports, partially supports, does not support, not applicable, and not evaluated. The only time that it's legitimate to use not evaluated is for the WCAG 2.1 or 2.0 level AAA guidelines. If you use evaluate it under another condition, that's going to be considered wrong. Also, when you're filling in the WCAG tables, you may use the term supports interchangeably with the term not applicable. So when you're saying something partially supports or does not support, you must include remarks that explain what is it that doesn't work, how it doesn't work, what's the impact, and if there's an accessible alternative available to identify it. So you can see here we have that information for supports also, where it identifies in the remarks that uh, a Roadrunner tool was tested for, and it lists all of the things uh, that was tested for 1.1.1. But it's, it's very important that if your conformance level is partially supports or does not support, that the remarks be as expansive as possible about what the issues are. And if you have a public bug database, for example, if this is an ACR for an open source product, uh, linking to the actual bug tickets is really helpful for the people in procurement and the people using the software so that at any time they can look and see what the status update is for that bug ticket. Other best practices that are good for remarks include uh, approach to regarding uh, the test for whatever the criteria is, information about operating systems, frameworks, and browsers. For example, you might need to disclose a bug that only appears in one particular browser. So you would want to call that out uh, in your remarks section. How they can find more example, uh, sorry, more information about the accessibility issue. So a bug ID uh, is helpful there and whether or not there are any known workarounds. So a best practice for bug reporting is to include the workarounds. So we have here that uh, there's some logical movement requirements that aren't being met. So the search tab is skipped when tabbing through the pages, but you can get there if you go one field past to the name field and then use shift tab uh, to come backwards. And then there's a bug that identifies that information. Other sections that you can do in an ACR include a branding header. So for example, you might want to include a standard header for your corporation. If you don't want to do that, it's uh, conceivable that if you used a third party tester, that the third party tester may request to put their branding header at the top of your report. Whether or not there are any changes to the report, whether or not there are any notes to the report. And this is a good place, especially for complicated software that relies on other products where you could point to those other products, uh, ACRs. So for example, if you're using a particular design system, you could point to that design system ACR. If you're using a Linux product, you could point to the Linux ACR for that particular product. And then finally, if you have a legal department, chances are they're going to want to include a disclaimer at the bottom of all of your ACRs. So these files can get really, really long. The template starts at 20 pages, and by the time you fill in all of the remarks and notes and all the different tables that you need to use, you could be looking at a complicated product of an VCR, uh, sorry, an ACR that runs between 40 and 100 pages. So there are ways that you can make the file shorter um, without invalidating the content of the ACR. 
there's instructions, there's tables, and there are sections that you can remove when they don't apply. So for example, the first nine to 10 pages of the 20 page ACR template are actually instructions for the author of the ACR for how to complete it. You're definitely gonna wanna delete those because the readers of the ACR don't need them. There's a, a note section and there's two different places that you can put notes. You can either put them in uh, the notes section at the top of the ACR, or you can include them in the chapter sections. You don't have to put them in both. Uh, so for example, you might do something like you say, uh, all of the criteria in the hardware section are not applicable because the product isn't hardware. And then you could go ahead and delete the hardware tables to make the ACR shorter. Or you could put that information at the notes section at the top. When there are, there's four different reports altogether in terms of templates. There's a WCAG edition of the ACR. There's a 508 edition of the ACR. There's an EN301549 edition. And then there's an international edition that combines all three of the other editions. You can either do these three separately or you can do them combined in the international edition. Sometimes your procurement officers will, for, for where you're bidding uh, your software, will ask you for a particular version. They'll say, we want to see the revised section 508 edition, or we want to see the EN301549 edition. Even though that those are included in the international edition, sometimes they want them separated out. In terms of removing the EN301549 sections, uh, you can uh, put in comments again, like the hardware section, where you can say, look, we're just omitting this section because it, none of this applies to us. All it would be is a string of not applicables. And so you can shorten your ACR by removing that information. If you're doing an ACR that is specifically tested to WCAG 2.0, there are two different ways you can handle the WCAG 2.1 results you can either take each WCAG 2.1 line item and put that it's not applicable. And you can see here on the table from guideline 2.5.1 to 2.5.4, each of the conformance levels is listed as not applicable. And then each of the remarks says WCAG 1 results are not applicable because it's not included in this ACR. But a shorter way of doing it is to just mark that WCAG 2.1 zero was tested and not 2.1 at the top of the ACR, and then just delete those rows from the table because all of those not applicable ro rows don't really add a ton of value to the reader. And that makes it shorter, which makes it easier for the reader. You can also combine WCAG tables. So for example, if you have level A, that's in one table, level AA is in a second table. However, you can combine them both as is seen on the left-hand side here, where you've got double A and A mixed into a single table. The reason why I like doing it this way is it makes it easier to see the consecutive numbers that are going back and forth between the A and the double A, and it's easier for the reader to check and make sure that something wasn't accidentally omitted. So the approach that we take at VMware is the left, which is to combine the two tables, but either choice is perfectly acceptable. So now we're going to look at a few good ACRs and a couple of bad ACRs. So this is a bad ACR because it doesn't use the uh, required conformance levels. You can see we've got passes we, and no supports. We've got irrelevant instead of not applicable. Um, and we have minor exceptions, which is also not an allowed conformance level. Don't make up your own conformance levels. You get five. Those are the only five that you can use. So here's a good example. You can see that we've got supports, not applicable, supports, partially supports, and supports again, with the appropriate remarks to the right-hand side of the conformance level. So here's an example of not applicable being used incorrectly. So you can see we've got a line item here for captions, which is row one dot guideline 1.2.2 that says it's not applicable, and then it says captions are not provided for pre-recorded content. 
Well, if captions aren't provided for pre-recorded content, that is does not support. That is not not applicable. Not applicable literally means that the guideline doesn't apply to your product because you don't have that thing being triggered in your product. So here's an example of where not applicable is being used correctly. We don't have synchronized media. We don't have audio only or video only content. And so the conformance level is legitimately not applicable. So we want to thank you for watching module six of our eight modules on VPAT. If you have any questions or feedback, you can email info at itic.org, telephone 1-202-737-8888. We want to thank the corporations that contributed to the creation and production of these videos, Hewlett Packard, IBM, Intel, Lexmark, Oracle, and VMware. Thank you.